our work is primarily focused, as Carlos mentioned, on software and more specifically on ArcGIS. I want to share some of that to give you a glimmer of what will come, what I think will come. First off, our principles are that ArcGIS is a complete system. It has many parts, mobile parts, desktop parts, server parts, um, web parts, uh, developer parts, but in total, it's a, it's a big geographic information system. It's also a geographic information platform or a geospatial platform for development. It, people implement it in three basic patterns. The first and largest pattern is the desktop, and there are millions of users who work on the desktop. They have their own data. They are now increasingly accessing web services and integrating data off the web. The second real big pattern is the server pattern, database pattern, application services pattern, which are more focused in departments or in enterprises. Uh, and I'm going to be out of power in a moment. If I, <laughs> you'll, you'll miss my presentation, so here we go. Uh, somebody should really plug me in. Looks like I got it. That's uh, The server pattern is oriented to departmental sorts of activities or even whole enterprises. And by stringing together multiple servers, we were able to achieve what some people called enterprise implementations using SOA architectures. The third pattern is this new pattern of the cloud web, which is a different pattern. This pattern is dramatically different. It's not like the mainframe. It's not like the many. It's not like the workstation. It's not like the PC. It's, it's, a, it's a dramatically different pattern. I'll try to get to that in a couple of minutes. But let me first simply mention that ArcGIS in general, in the desktop, in the server, in the, in the web, is advancing rapidly. The way that we implement uh, our technology is through releases. Release 10.0 is the current release. Release 10.1 is coming out sometime in the first quarter of next year. This has literally thousands of small and, in some cases, big improvements that are associated with it. These are a sort of list of some of the big highlights in them. And I want to hit those highlights quickly, and then my colleagues are going to demonstrate them later today. A lot of advances in cartography and editing tools, especially in the area of generalization. We have rule-based generalization. We have dynamic legends, so as you zoom in and out of a map, the legend changes. There's better labeling. There's more, Im more improvements in the templates for editing. And something that many users have asked for is feature level tracking. Now, that's a pretty detailed little thing that uh, you might ask, why am, I, why am I talking about it? Because it's key to being able to do feature level metadata. So if I want to know who added a particular feature in a massive database or who changed a particular feature and maintain that as, as a record, we'll be able to do that in 10.0. Also, there's more map automation tools using Python. In the area of science, there are many new analytic operators, things like grouping analysis or multiple scale spatial autocorrelation or one of my favorite ones is something called exploratory regression. Uh, perhaps some of you are not statisticians in the room, so I'll try to do my own version of this. If I have one map, let's call it a disease pattern, I can associate that with a series of other map layers and try to find some statistical correlation between the, say, disease that's occurring and other layers. That's, that's almost magical for GIS for it allows us to spatially relate one phenomena to another and then be able to build predictive models. And that's interesting from a market dynamic perspective, from an ecological perspective, from a biological perspective, from physical geography, almost everything. In addition, we're adding something called aerial interpolation. This allows us to take data at one aerial unit, like, say, city blocks, 
and interpolate it into another aerial unit, let's call it postal codes, using an advanced statistical interpolation technique. This has been a problem that's confounded cartographers for years. And then a bunch of other things that are, that are exciting. At 10.1, we do better image integration. This is very fast visualization from servers and from desktops, uh, better analytic tools, and better integration with some of our partner tools like ITT Viz for advanced geospatial processing. This makes ArcGIS a massively scalable image processing system. Mobile is the big dimension. And the way our mobile technologies work are first, we support all brands, that is the iPhone and the iOS, as well as Android, as well as the Windows and, uh, and uh, Windows Phone and Windows Mobile environments. This multi-brand uh, approach takes more time and it's more difficult, but what it allows us to do is say, you can choose if you want to have iPhone or if you want to have Android, it really doesn't matter. We support both SDK developer kits and also end-user applications. This is one of the hottest and fastest growing parts of our, of our marketplace, frankly. And with the server, these developer kits and these applications are just included. They're free, basically. This connects the field worker and citizens back to the enterprise system. So it's not simply that I have a map on my mobile device. I have a map that's connected into my server so that if I make edits in the field, my server is up to date. Every citizen becomes a sensor back to the, to the database, which may be inside of an enterprise. GIS is expanding in three dimensions as well. More tools for 3D visualization and also more tools for 3D analytics. 3D buffer zones, for example, 3D view sheds, 3D editing. So it's a 3D world. Why have we had ArcGIS oriented almost entirely to 2D in the past. This is changing dramatically. And this year, through the acquisition of a world-class company in Switzerland called Procedural, ESRI has acquired new technology for content generation, 3D content generation. This organization has built a rule-based system for creating content like these interesting buildings here in Paris, or this uh, fly-through in Afghanistan. These 3D content generation tools will mean that our users will be able to not only do visualization and analytics and editing of 3D information, but also generate uh, simulated and real information about buildings in urban landscapes. This will help us not only create beautiful fly-through visualizations, but more importantly, support the urban designer when they're creating or designing the future, as Carlos talked about it. <clears throat> In the technical area, 10.1 supports better integration with LiDAR. We're not processing LiDAR like some of our partners out here do, but we are building LiDAR into the database in such a way that it leverages a dynamic on-the-fly generation of visualizations from LiDAR from a special data structure. It's a mosaic data structure that we apply in image processing. This means the practical application of LiDAR measurements in virtually everything that we do. LiDAR is exponentially growing. We're measuring it from one centimeter to, to uh, one meter in, in different settings. How do we bring all of this LiDAR information together? 10.1 gives us a solution for doing that. Many of our users have complained about ARC objects or our components of the ArcGIS system as being difficult to use, slow, a large footprint, running only in Windows, 32-bit, and uh, like that. So with release of 10.1, we have a new runtime, which is very easy to deploy, very small, very tiny. It's uh, very fast for display and visualization and tracking. Um, it's Windows and Linux. Uh, it's 64-bit native as well as 32-bit. 
and it supports the development environments of WPF and Java and Qt. So uh, this will change the deployment of GIS in mobile devices like ruggedized uh, applications, but also in lightweight applications that get embedded. Uh, okay. This is kind of like, yeah, you like it good. Well, go ahead, do it. <laughs> I appreciate that. This will be deployed kind of like Map Objects was. Uh, in other words, a very inexpensive, embeddable technology, uh, especially designed for developers. ArcGIS Server at 10.1 also makes some significant improvements. Uh, it's faster, it's much easier to install, it has a complete system administration dashboard for administrating the server. Um, it allows us to very simply create a map service or analytic service. It's running in 64-bit native mode, something you've asked for for years. Um, it's a very strong implementation of Linux as well as Windows. Our Linux implementation has been weaker in the past, oddly enough, and we wanted to wait until we did the 64-bit rollover in order to really roll that out. Most of our users are still Windows. This will allow a open source, sandwich, high performance implementation of the server. And it's highly scalable. This is, this is uh, for a variety of reasons, one of the best server releases that we've ever had. It continues to support open standards and adds a number of new standards. Uh, it supports web printing directly. Uh, it supports something we call on-the-fly symbology, so you can have one database with multiple views, uh, symbolic views generated by the browser. And then it just improves the web APIs for those of you who are developing web apps. Web apps are becoming a major piece of the ArcGIS system. Flex, Silverlight, JavaScript, SharePoint integration, and ArcGIS Explorer. These are web applications that you can download, customize, extend. They're open source in nature. And uh, many users have said, well, Jack, why don't you just go with Flex or just with Silverlight or just with JavaScript or, or, uh, or the like? What we're doing is spending resources with multiple teams to support these different environments so that you have the ability to choose as you wish to do dev in. We don't want to say there's only one way in this particular case because in the web world, there are many ways, there are many reasons why our users want to go in one direction or the other. These are very easily configured, they're free, they work directly with any GIS server, and uh, they're, they're really fueling an explosion of accessibility. Let me say that ArcGIS at 10.1 will simplify how you create services and share your data. If you are a desktop user, you can very simply upload your data and map MXD to a server and it'll automatically turn it into a service in about 30 seconds. Um, what this means exactly is that I can be in a desktop ArcGIS system in ArcMap, I can right click and I can send my map over to a server and it automatically turns it into a web service that people can look at from a browser. So a press guy was interviewing me a couple days ago. He said, well, Jack, you know, uh, consumer maps, they're, you know, Google and Microsoft and you're not in that business. I tried to explain to him that we have about 100,000 of these servers that are out there that are serving out on the web, building, you know, hundreds of millions of maps every day for consumers, but they aren't the kind of search-oriented consumer map. This little invention that I'm showing here will exponentially grow that number of maps. I'll be able to right-click after I'm finished with an ARC session, send it over to my ArcGIS server, create a web map in about 15 or 30 seconds, and immediately make that available as a standard WMS, KML, map service to anybody who wants to look at it. I'll be able to do that not only with my own server, but I'll also be able to do it with a cloud server. So if I don't have a server, and I really want to create a map service, I can right click, send it over to ArcGIS Online, and it'll turn it into a map service and let people use it. 
You follow what I'm doing here? Maybe not. <laughs> you're, supposed to, you're supposed to get excited about that. Also, at 10.1, you'll be able to share not only layer packages and map packages, but also models, analytic models. All right, I've talked quite a bit about maybe 5% of the feature functions that are in 10.1. You'll see more of them today. And by the way, 10.1 is already in beta, and I encourage you to download the beta. It's a free beta and an open beta this time around. The next big step is pretty dramatic. That's a step that's going on in parallel with the ArcGIS 10.1 environment. And the next big step is really ArcGIS Online. This is a new cloud pattern where ArcGIS is in the cloud. Not simply a copy of server in the cloud, but I'm talking about a total system, an open platform for sending data to, managing data in, the, in a totally cloud environment, uh, th accessible by thick clients and thin clients. Uh, in other words, this model or metaphor that Carlos talked about about a cloud that covers the entire world mixed with geographic information that covers the entire world through little postage stamps on top of that world, your work uh, will be enabled. This environment has an interesting little secret in it. The secret is something we call or are calling intelligent web maps. Intelligent web maps are a kind of new medium for sharing your geographic data. An intelligent web map is actually not data. It's simply like a mashup uh, of multiple services brought together and encapsulated as a very small little file. And so as this diagram shows, I might have map services or analytic services or a model that are living on distributed servers or in the cloud itself. I can bring them together, make a beautiful combination map, and store the combination map. And others then can take that map and visualize it and edit it. Uh, if I author it correctly, I can put a pop-up inside of the map so I can interact and see data and maps about it. Um, I can do analytics. I can run it as these maps show. I can do drive time or analytics with them. And, uh, and also I can do temporal analysis, like uh, with a slider bar looking at change through time. In other words, these intelligent web maps are a new medium. And these intelligent web maps can be used on anything. So instead of just on, um, just on my desktop, I can use them in my tablet. I can use them on any tablet. I can use them on any smartphone. I can embed my smart map right into my social media, my blog. I can take my web map and I can put it inside of, a, of my website. And, uh, or in a browser, or whatever. You get the idea of this? What it, what it actually means is that I can have distributed services that are transactionally being maintained on separate servers, like this diagram suggests. I can bring them together in this little magical medium, and I can share that with everybody else. So as the weather changes, my map mashup changes. As my street traffic changes, it changes. As my parcel ownership changes, my intelligent web map changes. It's kind of a, a new media form. What, I, what, what this means is that GIS professionals can share into this ArcGIS and line environment as intelligent web maps. But also one other really important part is that I can take any other kind of data, like a shape file, and make it into an intelligent map. I can take a CSV file from my spreadsheets and just drag and drop and make an intelligent web map. I can take GPS data, create an intelligent, I can take KML, I can put it in, create an intelligent web map. I can take any geospatial data built on standards. So it's like an hourglass. An hourglass at the bottom brings in many different data types, and then it feeds out in open standards, as well as into simple viewers that policy people, managers, knowledge workers can discover, and they can interact with these, they can access them, they can visualize them, 